Welcome to the Sports Spectrum Podcast, where faith and sports collide. Here's your host, Jason Romano. This episode of the Sports Spectrum Podcast, episode number 116 with James Ihedebo, is sponsored in part by Compassion International. We're so excited and thankful that Compassion is on board as a sponsor and as a partner with us here at Sports Spectrum. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum and sponsor a child today. You can provide a child with hope, releasing them from poverty for just $38 a month. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum and sponsor a child today. Today's guest on the podcast is James Ihedebo, played 10 years in the NFL with the Jets, the Patriots, the Ravens, the Lions, and the Buffalo Bills. In March of 2018, he officially announced his retirement from the game. He played his college ball at the University of Massachusetts, up here in Amherst, Massachusetts. He played in two Super Bowls, 2011 with the New England Patriots, Super Bowl 46 in a 21-17 loss to the New York Giants. That was the second of the two Super Bowls that the Patriots and Giants faced each other in. And then 2012, as a member of the Baltimore Ravens in Super Bowl 47, his team, led by Joe Flacco, the Super Bowl MVP, beat the San Francisco 49ers 34-31 to and became Super Bowl champs. So James has a Super Bowl ring. And like I said, he just retired a couple months before taping this interview. And uh, we have a good conversation here. James is He's got quite the journey. He wasn't one of those guys that were drafted high in the NFL. He was undrafted, had to kind of earn his way into the league, and ended up playing for a decade in the NFL. Not too shabby. And he also grew up with immigrant parents from Nigeria who came over in the late 70s from Nigeria and ended up in Massachusetts and had to raise five kids, including James and his three brothers and sister. And we talk a lot about what it was like growing up for James with parents from Nigeria and then kind of navigating the faith world and the sports world and this sort of culture in the United States that was probably much different than it was in Nigeria. And then James had to deal with some tragedy. His dad passed away as he was getting ready to go to college. And we talked to James on this podcast about overcoming that, the void that his dad left, where his faith played a part in that and kind of finding out who Jesus Christ was for himself. His parents raised him Christian, but there came a point where he had to come to know the Lord for himself. And we talk a lot of football. We talk a lot about his journey um, from college to the NFL, the spiritual battles that he faced as an NFL player. He also played with two of the greatest quarterbacks in the history of the NFL, in Brett Favre with the Jets and Tom Brady, of course, with the Patriots. So we ask him about Brett and about Tom and what that was like, that experience. And then we get into what this whole situation with the NFL right now and the National Anthem is about, but not necessarily just debating or arguing, but just what our response should be as Christians to all of this, Uh, seeing it through the lens of Christ, not through the lens of our own feelings or beliefs or thoughts, and being a Christian NFL player and the response that James believes uh, we should all have. So without further ado, I, I, I really like talking to James. I think you guys will enjoy this interview. Let's get right to it. He is James Ihedebo, 10-year NFL defensive back right here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Take a listen. James, it's great to talk to you. We're, we're grateful to have you on the podcast and been wanting to talk to you for a while now. Uh, and before we get into some more serious topics and sort of some deep layered topics, especially with regards to faith and and sports, let's let's start a little light and let's start with the NBA of all things. Now, as we're taping this, the NBA finals are going on and I see you tweeting a ton about the, the playoffs, especially about LeBron. Where does that love uh, for hoops come from uh, for you? Um, you know, I grew up in Amherst, Massachusetts and I went to UMass, which is, you know, uh, mainly a basketball school. Um, you know, we had a lot of, you know, success playing football. Um, but, you know, just growing up when, you know, UMass was the number one team in the nation with Marcus Camby and, you know, uh, Dante, uh, you know, Dana Dingle and all these, you know, guys that were um, potentially had shots in the NBA. But just growing up and having that genuinely uh, genuine love for basketball is kind of kind of how I was raised. And now I see you're active all over social media with these games, and I love it. You have an opinion, just like we all do when we're watching them. And certainly 
everybody seems to have an opinion on LeBron James. Where does he rank for you? Are you a, are you pro LeBron or are you kind of like just over his his act? Where does he rank in the NBA pantheon for you? You, you know, for me, LeBron is uh, the best player um, ever, if you ask me. I mean, okay. you look at, um, you know, what his body of work is. You know, I like to compare it to, uh, you know, Tom Brady. We look at, you know, Tom Brady and we've seen him this era, I guess our era, and just dominate the sport. Um, you know, continually with, you know, what arguably would be lesser talent around him. He allows them to rise to the occasion, step their their game up, so to speak. And um, each year you can count them, you know, being in the Super Bowl or, or one of the final uh, teams playing for it. And, um, you know, I compare LeBron to the exact same, you know, stint in, in the NBA. Um, consistently, you know, bringing uh, his A game, elevating those around him. You know, his numbers speak for himself. Uh, he's one of those guys that, can score at will. Um, you see, even now he has, you know, worked and uh, continued to work at his jump shot. So it makes him even more of an arsenal, uh, have an, a stronger arsenal. But then at the, you just look at his body of work. I mean, the guy has played in eight straight NBA finals. Um, I mean, that's domination at the highest level. And for me, um, you know, for you to not or dislike LeBron for whatever reason, um, I think it has something to do with your competitive edge because, I mean, I, I love the way he competes and what he brings to the table. And you, you obviously you played in the NFL for many years, so you are an elite or were an elite athlete, we'll say, in terms of playing at the highest level in football, uh, now retired, of course. But the, does it does it, the view of greatness in sports look different from somebody like yourself who played at the highest level, played against some of the greatest athletes ever? than myself who has covered the game and been around the game for many years but has not never played at that level is that fair to say yeah. that you look at it differently of, of course of course because you know as a player in you know competing you know playing 10 years in, in in the nfl i knew uh the amount of training and effort it takes to be at the top of my game each year you know, to continue on in my in, in playing in the NFL and having a contract. You know, it's not like other sports where, you know, it's a guaranteed money. Essentially, in the NFL, you have to prove yourself each year in every training camp um, that you belong. And so when you see a player like LeBron, who's been in the NBA now for 16 years, and each year not only dominate but improve and get better, um, you know, with his performance uh, – you know, it says something to his work ethic and what he's doing in the off season that people aren't seeing. And, um, you know, his mindset in terms of being a cerebral player on the court and not relying just on his his talent and ability, um, that speaks louder to me than just being able to, you know, get on the court, dribble, shoot some shots and, you know, get the crowd going. There's there's more to LeBron than what than what meets the eye. We're talking to James Ahedebo here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Now, looking at your bio, you grew up with three brothers and a sister and was born in Northampton, Massachusetts. Now, that's not too far from where I grew up in Albany, New York, uh, but the history of your family and its Nigerian heritage goes back even further. Tell us about growing up and, and really what stems from your parents uh, not being born in the United States. Yeah, it was, um, you know, it was kind of, I don't want to use the word different in terms of you know you know as a negative thing but um it really was where you know we grew up my parents they both came from uh, Nigeria kind of in the the late 70s um you know they came to the United States for you know education they you know um were in Nigeria where they didn't have a lot of resources they knew that the best thing if they were going to raise a family would, would have to be essentially leave the country. And so they did so. They came to uh, UMass, to Massachusetts. Uh, my dad worked um, during the, the, the day as a pizza delivery guy. And um, at night he went to school and my mom went to school during the day. And then, you know, at night, um, you know, she was, she, was, she was home with us. And for both of them to earn, you know, their PhDs in early in education, you know, my mom and early childhood education and my dad um, in education. Uh, for me, seeing that, that foundation as a child, um, 
it really made uh, me grow up with a mindset that growing up here in the United States, there's nothing that I couldn't accomplish, you know, if I put my faith and, and my mind to it. Was faith always something, you mentioned that word faith, was faith always something that was important to you and your family from an early age? Um, it truly was. You know, my parents knew that it wasn't only by, you know, the hand of God that they were um, able to come to the United States and 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 get that uh, that opportunity. Uh, believe it or not, um, they came to the United States through um, uh, the missionaries from Oral Roberts University. So, hmm. um, you know, through that um, and being introduced to Christ and being introduced to you know what God can do in their lives is how you know, that, 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 that vision, so to speak, that whole thought process of coming to the United States was made possible. So, you know, we grew up in a household where, you know, faith was the cornerstone, um, of our house. Um, every Saturday morning, um, we would have family Bible study where, uh, we, my dad would, you know, open up a word and, you know, every child would read a verse and, you know, he would explain it to us and, and pray with us. And, you know, that foundation, uh, in our household is, has kind of, um, you know, uh, been the cornerstone and helped, you know, uh, uh, catapult our faith to, uh, to the next level as adults. What about sports as a kid, uh, and sort of navigating that, especially with, uh, you know, parents from Nigeria, was that complicated? Was that uh, fairly simple in terms of just like, Hey, I want to play sports. Can I play? And you played, what was that like? Yeah. Growing up in our household, I mean, everyone, you know, played a sport. My sister, she ran track, um, you know, me and all my brothers, we played just about every sport possible. We, uh, you know, played basketball, football. Um, I even played lacrosse in college. Uh, you know, one of the things um, when I was younger, I was about, you know, six, seven years old. And I was, you know, playing soccer. I was really good at it. I played goalie and, um, you know, very, you know, very athletic. And it wasn't until that age when I was introduced to football and you know, I remember telling and asking, well, asking my dad if I could play. And he was, you know, he, you know, said no. You know, he saw it on TV, all the, you know, the the hits and, you know, the pads and all of that. He just just didn't think it was, you know, he wanted his son playing. And then, you know, me being, you know, the stubborn kid that I was, <laughs> I ended up, um, you know, going to, you know, practice and playing. And uh, I fell in love with it. And, you know, he gave me his blessings and he came to a game one time and, you know, saw how, how good I was and I uh, had a, you know, big 60 yard run, you know, for a touchdown. And, and he, after that, he never missed a game. He was at every single game after that supported me, um, you know, and, and, and my friends, uh, you know, throughout the whole process. Faith is always something that, especially when you grow up in a home with faith at the center of it, it's sort of instilled in you. But at some point as adults, or even as teenagers, we have to develop a faith of our own. Was there a moment for you uh, when you said, okay, this was my parents' faith and now this faith in Christ is, is truly mine? Was there a moment for you when that took place? Yeah, for, you know, for me it was, um, you know, kind of when I was getting ready to go to college. Um, my, my dad passed away my senior year of high school. Mm -hmm. And, you know, right as that transition, you know, where you're really making that transition in manhood, you know, God saw it fit and said, you know, I got, you know, I truly got you from, from here. You know, you know, everything that you need as a man, I'll give to you. And, you know, from, from that point, I was, I was in pretty, pretty, pretty much what I would call had a, a dark cloud over my head, so to speak. You know, I was, you know, volatile. I was, you know, behavioral issues, um, you know, uh, a, a lot of uh, negativity. And that was when it dawned on me and said, you know, you know, this, you know, I, I've been raised in this and, um, you know, I know what, you know, what I should think, but, you know, I need to experience this for myself. And that's why I feel like God brought me through that um, and into that point to say, you know, James, you have to choose me. You know, it's not enough saying that, you know, this is my parents' faith and this is how I raised, so I'm a Christian. You know, so what is it what does it truly mean to be a Christian? And, you know, there was a, you know, quick story. I went to a spring break with, you know, uh, you know, one of my close friends, you know, still my best friend to this day. 
And, you know, our mindset was, hey, we're going to go to spring break. We're going to party. We're going to have a good time. You know, what you do, you know, kind of in college and, you know, or your your freshman year of college. And, um, you know, his mom asked us, said, hey, you know, I'm getting ready to, you know, to go to go to church. Uh, would you guys want to come? And, you know, that wasn't on our agenda. You know, we, <laughs> you know, we, that wasn't, that wasn't something that, that we thought, um, you know, we were going to experience you know, but we didn't want to be disrespectful. So we said, yeah, of course, you know, we'll come. And, um, you know, during that, that service, you know, I really had the, you know, the mindset of, okay, you know, how quick can this get over? So, you know, we can get out of here and have some fun. And in the midst of that, the pastor stopped and said, you know, son, God's hand is on your life. And, you know, I looked around, I was like, you know, he's talking to somebody else. He can't be you know, talking to me. He doesn't even know me from, from Tuesday. Hmm. And he said, no, I'm, you know, I'm talking to you. He said, come up here. Um, and, you know, I walked to the front a little reluctantly. And, um, you know, he said, you know, God told me to pray for you. He said, uh, you know, you have a have a dark cloud over your head. But, you know, God said he wants to remove it. He wants to give you clarity, um, give you peace. And, um, you know, and he prayed for me that day. And, and I remember, you know, like it was like it was yesterday. And, you know, for that was one of the first times that I truly experienced, you know, a peace that surpasses all understanding, a, a peace and a love, um, kind of a weight lifted off my shoulders, um, a comfort. And I was like, I, you know, this is what this is what I want, you know. And God said, you know, you have to make the choice to choose me. And and so I did. And um, of course, you know, there's you know, there's. You know, there's always bumps, you know, throughout the process. It's never going to be uh, an overnight fix, you know. That's why we, you know, we thank God for, you know, the sanctification process, you know, in terms of, you know, being saved um, and what that means. And, you know, and so it it really has, you know, through different mentors and, um, you know, helped me, you know, grow my faith to, you know, where it's at, um, you know, today and how, you know, God's going to continue to grow it. How did you react or initially, and, and what was that void like when you lost your father? And then trying to move on from that, especially at a, a very, like you say, influential age. And obviously that story of coming to faith is is an incredible one. And obviously that had a gigantic impact on your future uh, and the rest of your life. But what was that void like losing your father? Um, it was, you know, very, very painful. I mean, you know, it's, you know, when you know, your father, you know, being a, you know, the father of five, you know, children, you know, you raise, you know, all your kids differently and parents, you know, that, you know, listening, they'll, they'll know that, that they have a unique relationship with, you know, every one of their children. Um, you know, I have, you know, two and one on the way. And even with my two girls, I have a distinct relationship. So, um, you know, having that void, um, at that age, uh, was, was big for me. You know, I was, you know, getting ready to go play college football. And, you know, my dad was such a fan and uh, never missed one of my high school games, whether it was, you know, home or away. Um, if it meant him leaving work early, he was, you know, always at our games. And, um, you know, to have that no longer was was a big hit for me to. Um, and, you know, in that, you know, I fell into, you know, what I would now say is depression. I, I fell into, you know, um, you know, my freshman year of uh, college, abusing alcohol and really, you know, living a self-destructive lifestyle where, you know, at the time you wouldn't think so. You would say, hey, I got it under control. I, you know, I'm good. You know, I'll get through this. Um, but, you know, you know, you look back and say, well, no, I'm, I'm glad that I that God pulled me out of that because, you know, I don't know where I would have ended up. You know, I, I don't know if I would have, you know, been able to finish playing college football or, you know, earned a scholarship or, you know, made it to the NFL if I was still living that that style of lifestyle. So, you know, I'm for, forever thankful that, you know, that, you know, relationship with with Christ, you know, pulled me out of that. We'll get back to our conversation with James E. Hedebo in just a moment, but I want to take a second to tell you guys about Compassion International. $38 a month, releasing a child from poverty in Jesus' name. 150,000 children 
chose to follow Jesus Christ in the last year alone because of the great work being done by Compassion International. And we're so excited about partnering with them in our ministry and just love the work that they're doing, bringing education and tutoring, medical care and food and vocational training, all done in the name of the Lord because of people like you. $38 $38 a month, and you sponsor a child, and you make a difference, and that money goes directly to providing hope for this child. My wife, myself, my daughter, we all sponsor a 13-year-old boy from Haiti, and it is the best $38 we spend every single month. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum, and you too can make a difference. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum and sponsor a child today. Now back to our interview with former NFL defensive back, 10 years in the league and Super Bowl 47 champion, James Ehedebo. We're talking to James Ehedebo here, the former NFL defensive back on the Sports Spectrum podcast. You mentioned UMass. That's where you went to college. Very successful there. But then you go undrafted. And, you know, we go back to trials and how they can shape us or break us in many ways. And... Take us back to 2007 and what that was like for you. You weren't selected into the NFL draft, and yet you had a dream to play. You obviously accomplished that dream 10 years in the NFL. But what was that like back then uh, for you in in the sort of unconventional way that you had to earn your your keep into the NFL and not just be selected by a team? What was that like? Yeah, um, it it took a lot for me uh, mentally. I mean, I remember, you know, preparing for the NFL and you have the combines, you have the, you know, workouts and individual workouts with teams. And I remember the Atlanta Falcons, you know, taking my name and telling me, Hey, we're very interested in you. And, um, you know, we, we think you could be really be a Falcon. And even day two of the draft, I knew I wasn't you know going to be a day one guy coming from a small town school. And, um, you know, I was looked, you know, projected to be probably a fifth or sixth, uh, seventh round draft pick. And, you know, I was okay with that. My my thought process is, Lord, just give me an opportunity. Let me just have an opportunity to show what I can do. And, you know, even if I could play one year in the NFL, you know, to prove, you know, everyone, you know, coming from a small town that, you know, that I was good enough to do it. And that was truly my mindset. And, you know, day two of the draft and uh, sixth round comes and I get a call from, uh, the Cincinnati Bengals, and they say, hey, you know, we have, uh, you know, uh, a draft pick coming up here in the seventh round, and we're, we're thinking about taking you. Just uh, make sure you stay by your phone. Hmm. And, you know, I had the family gathered around the TV like, hey, this is this is it. You know, what's about to happen? And, um, you know, they ended up picking an offensive lineman. And they called me right back after their pick and said, hey, you know, sorry we didn't pick you there. Um but we want to, you know, bring you out to our, our rookie mini camp next week. And, you know, so they signed me to a, you know, potential deal. And I go out there for rookie mini camp and, you know, they, they drafted a safety in the fourth round and they drafted a safety in the sixth round. And they just, you know, said, Hey, we don't have any space for you. We like what you could do, but sorry, we can't keep you. Wish you the best of luck and sent me home. And, I remember getting back to, you know, Springfield, Massachusetts, where we we lived at the time and um, looking out my window and just saying, you know, God, if, you know, if this is something that you want me to do, you know, show me, show me what, what's next, what direction should I go? And um, I remember I went and talked to uh, my coach at the time at UMass, uh, Don Brown, he's a defensive coordinator for Michigan now. And um, he uh, said, he's like, man, he's like, uh, those guys in Cincinnati didn't sign you. And I was like, nah, coach, you know, they, you know, drafted a couple safeties. Let me go. And he's like, Hey, he's like, you're going to play in this league, son. And, uh, he called, uh, you know, Mike Tannenbaum, who's the general manager of the New York jets and said, Hey, uh, and also a UMass grad, you know, thank God. (laughs) Um, and he, you know, called him and said, Hey, you know, you guys looking at my, my, my safety here, uh, James ahead of and he's, and Mike Tannenbaum said, you know, believe it or not, yeah, we we're actually going to call him later on this week to invite him to our rookie mini camp. Hmm. And, um, you know, so lo and behold, um, you know, they gave me a call. They uh, invited me and they said, hey, if you um, they said specifically pack, pack your stuff like you're not going going back to Massachusetts, because if we like you, we'll sign you. And, you know, that was God kind of showing me, here's your chance, you know. 
here's your opportunity um, that you asked me for. And, uh, you know, I went out there and, you know, draft picks, you know, first rounder was Darrell Revis and second rounder was David Harris. And, you know, they had, you know, both stellar careers in the NFL. And I just said, well, whatever Revis does, I'm going to do. You know, whether it means being in the front of the lines for bad drills, um, that was really my mindset, whatever it takes. And, um, you know, during that mini camp, uh, I ended up, you know, kind of pulling my hamstring where I couldn't, couldn't practice. I couldn't do the last day where the conditioning test was. And, you know, so they had me off to the side pulling a sled uh, 50 yards and then doing 50 sit-ups and then pulling a sled back and kind of doing that while the guys were doing their conditioning test. And I said, okay, well, this isn't going to define me, you know, God. I was like, just, you know, give me strength. And next thing I know, it was me and three other guys, and I'm lapping these guys while I'm doing it. (laughs) And Eric Mangini and, you know, Mike Tannenbaum are looking over at me, and, you know, there's something that resonated with them in terms of my work ethic. And I remember, you know, sitting on the ground doing my sit-ups, and uh, the assistant GM walking over and say, James, hey, you just earned yourself a contract with the New York Jets. And, you know, being that sense of relief, the, the joy and being able to call my mom and um, knowing that she was praying for me the entire time that I was there. And, uh, you know, truly God opening a door, you know, that he would be glorified, um, you know, through it. And, 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 and he was so. That's great. I love hearing that story because every person, especially those that play in the NFL, have different journeys. And your journey, actually, your first game, you didn't make your debut until the following year in 2008 because of injuries, and you finally get your shot. Tell us about what you remember about that first NFL regular season game. You got the call, and you're playing, and all of a sudden, look at me. I'm in the game here with the Jets. What do you remember about that game? Yeah, well, leading up to it, Um, you know, I was, you know, on the practice squad for the first, you know, seven weeks of the season and lo and behold, the Cincinnati Bengals call and say, we want to, you know, sign you to our active roster. (laughs) You know, the Jets had the, you know, right for, you know, kind of first refusal, so to speak. And so the Jets said, you know, well, we want to add you and bring you up. And so they did. And coming out of the, the tunnel, um, I remember just standing there and, um, you know, here in the crowd and, you know, the, the J E T S jets, 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 the chant mm-hmm. going on before the game and just the energy and saying, wow, you know, like this is really, you know, this is really it. And, um, you know, just real quick prior to every game, um, you know, it was a point that, you know, my mom, um, you know, my wife and, and my brother, Nathaniel, we all, you know, got on a call right before I got on the bus and we'd pray. We'd before every game for 10 years, mm-hmm. we didn't miss one game and we would pray and just ask God to cover me, you know, God to protect me, God to allow me to play to the ability that he's given me. And, you know, that's something that we, you know, we did um, continually throughout my career. Um, and I really believe that that was a part of God elevating me, um, knowing that, you know, I would use my platform you know, for the purpose that he gave me. Um, so with all that being said, when I got out my first game and I stepped out on that field and just the joy and excitement, um, you know, playing alongside, you know, the Lavernius Coles and, um, you know, the Nick Mangolds and, you know, the, the even, you know, had a year, um, you know, with Chad Pennington, all those guys um, that came from all over, and having that sense of, man, I belong, you know, this is, this is where I belong amongst the best of the best. So, Well, there's a, a certain quarterback that was on your team that year too. Many people forget that one season that Brett Favre played in 2008. Yeah. That must've been interesting being around, you know, a legend like him. And, and I know it was your first time kind of getting on the field. And I love the story of praying before every game and that phone call with your family. But what do you remember about playing with Brett I know that was an injury injured year I think at the end for him yeah. uh, and started off as a good season and then kind of finished off uh, in a tough spot but what do you remember about playing with Brett well Brett you know he um you know I grew up of course like every player he, he was one of my childhood you know favorites just watching him you know as the, the gunslinger that he was 
And I one vivid memory that I had of you know playing with Brett was um, we had Eric Mangini as a coach who was you know came with the the Patriot way, very Belichick esque um, in terms of you know his approach. And Brett came in with a mindset of we're going to have fun. Hmm. You know, yeah, we're playing you know a game and it's a business, but we're going to have fun doing it. And I remember he. Um, you know, threw a touchdown pra- pa- pass in practice to um, – it was either – it was Jericho Cotri, and it was in the back of the end zone. And Brett runs down the field and picks Jericho up over his shoulder and, like, literally twirls him around like a little kid. <laughs> and just literally having that excitement, like, hey, guys, I know we – it's a grind and, you know, it's there's a lot on the on, on our plates here. But we're going to have fun doing it. And that was kind of an energy that he brought to our team. And something that he took pride in his whole entire career is, you know, letting it rip, so to speak. And um, that was one of the memories that I had, you know, playing with him saying, man, you know, it is serious. You can, you know, there's a time to be serious. But then there's also a time to have fun playing this game. And then you play with another legend in 2011 in Brady, who you mentioned earlier when we were talking about the NBA and LeBron. What what sticks out about that one season playing? Because you played against him many years as well, but then playing with him. Um, it was it was a great experience playing with, with Tom. Uh, really um, a personable guy. You know, one thing that really was was amazing to me is I came in – you know, the first day of meetings. And I'm like, you know, here's Tom Brady. Um, and you, you're like, oh, man, let me not even, like, say hi to him. He probably doesn't even know my name. Um, and, you know, he knew everybody on the team. He knew everyone by their first name. He, you know, talked and was interactive with everybody. But coming in that first meeting and and sitting there and with all his accolades, everything that he's done and accomplished, um, you know, to that point, uh you know, multiple Super Bowls and and Super Bowl MVPs. And he's sitting there in the front row and he's taking notes on everything that Belichick is saying, writing down the game plan, fl- flipping over his piece of paper, you know, writing down details in the corner. And for me, you know, that showed me that, you know, at this game, no matter what level that you are, you know, for you to have consistency, it takes consistent work ethic. It takes consistent preparation you know it takes consistent you know kind of being that same guy every day you know your teammates knowing what they're going to expect from you and um you know that was one of the first things that i learned from tom was you know this guy his his work ethic is impeccable he's he's on it every day there isn't a day off or oh man i had a bad day it's each day how can i prepare myself to get better and um, you know, that really helped me in terms of, um, you know, my preparation and, um, you know, my work ethic with, with, with my style of play. Does it surprise you? Cause it's just never really been done before that a quarterback at 40 years old can still be the best quarterback in the NFL. And he, he lost this super, this past Super Bowl to the Eagles, but he maybe played, that's what gets lost. I think in that Super Bowl was how good Brady was in that game. He was unbelievable. And he just, he's going to be 41 uh, this year and going yeah. into this season. I mean, you're 34 right now. So yeah. he's seven years older than you in essence and still the best player at his position. Does that blow you away a little bit and just kind of, or is that not surprising given the fact that you've seen him and been around him? No, it definitely does. It blows me away. Um, just when you think about sports in general, Yeah, you know, how many players do you know at any sport that are playing well into their forties and, even if they're playing that they're dominating the sport, you know, it's, it, it doesn't, it doesn't happen. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, we are, you know, witnessing greatness with every snap that he takes and every season that he plays. But in the same sense, being around him, it doesn't surprise me that he's the guy to do it. Um, you know, when you, you, you look at the game that he had in the Super Bowl and um, where he knows pre-snap, almost by the defense the defensive line's alignment where to go with where to go with the ball you know he can look at the d line and already know the coverage of the back end and say okay well you know this ball needs to go here and if this happens i already know where to go prior to the ball being snapped that takes you know a whole nother level of preparation and 
even at his age, there's not too many defenses that he hasn't seen or, you know, or wrinkles that you show him that, you know, that he doesn't really know how to, how to get through. And, you know, it, 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 it shows how, you know, his game continues to evolve and, you know, how his preparation, you know, continues to, to push him. And he is going to be one of those guys that are going to be playing well into his, his forties because he isn't letting up. He, he isn't letting up anytime soon. We're talking to James ahead of here on the sports spectrum podcast. Now, with Tom Brady, you make it to a Super Bowl in 2011, Super Bowl 46 with the Patriots, and you, you lose to the Giants 21-17. to The following season, you're with Baltimore, and you beat Tom Brady to get to the Super Bowl, and then you win it. You beat uh, Colin Kaepernick and the 49ers 34-31. to I wonder, just from the perspective of experiencing the, the lowest of lows, if you will, of losing, and then the highest of highs of winning the biggest game of the year in back-to-back seasons, what Super Bowl did you learn more from? Was it the one you lost or the one that you were victorious in? Um, that's a great question. You know, I, I truly believe that, you know, God allows everything, um, you know, that we go through, uh, you know, to teach us, you know, and it's sometimes it's teaching us and sometimes it's for you to teach, you know, another person that's going through it. And the the, the biggest thing for me was when we lost – um, the first Super Bowl against the Giants, I think I learned more um, about myself and, you know, about the game of football through that. Uh, you know, uh, going through that, that, the process, the preparation for two weeks before, you know, you have, you know, all your media obligations, you have, um, you know, uh, the family obligations, you, you have your preparation and uh, everyone seemed a bit, you know, uptight or even I would say myself I I didn't enjoy the the experience you know I didn't take it for what it was as a once in a lifetime opportunity it was you know really uptight for me and um and that showed in the way I played you know I didn't play my best football I wasn't you know letting it rip so to speak playing loose and you know we ended up coming coming up short and I remember that process where you know I didn't even want to watch ESPN I didn't want to you know, watch NFL Network, I really kind of was, you know, to a point just shaken up where I'm like, man, you know, like, this is everything that, you know, I worked, worked for as a kid, like this, you know, you play in the backyard, and you're like, hey, catch, you know, catching an interception to win, you know, the Super Bowl, and you're, you know, tossing the ball up, and man, we got so close, and, you know, we, we didn't, we didn't do it, um, and you always think back, man, what if I made that one play or what if I recovered that one fumble or, you know, things that would change the outcome of the game. But that's just the design of it. And it wasn't until the next year when I went to Baltimore and, you know, we're, you're playing in the Super Bowl again. And now I'm able to share my experiences, you know, with guys where this is their first time and, you know, what to expect and how to prepare and um, how to just enjoy the moment that, you know, all of this means you know, for nothing, if you don't win the game, like, you know, it's just enjoy it, Let, you know, and spend time with your family, create memories, you know, with our, us as teammates. And that's what we did. We went out to dinner. We enjoyed each other. We told jokes. We, you know, spent time with each other's families and really enjoyed the, the moment that when it was time to, to play ball, it was all right, let's just go have fun. And, 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 and we did, and we won. So has bleed, uh, yeah, and you got your ring, and you're wearing that ring proud and proud for sure. Uh, as as NFL players, uh, I wonder, especially believers in Christ, you know, it just let's just say believers in Christ in general, we're all facing spiritual battles. We all face temptations, and I think they're magnified or even more prominent when you're a professional athlete on a on a team that's playing in a game like the Super Bowl. What type of temptations did you face, James, during your career? And were there any kind of guardrails that you had to set up or boundaries that you had to set up to prevent you from, you know, falling into those temptations? Because we all fall. It's just a matter of yeah. learning from yeah. them and protecting ourselves from them. Of course. And, that, you know, I'm glad that you brought that up because, you know, early on, you know, in my career, you know, you you find out that you you have accessibility to everything. You know, there's really not too much where – um, you know, that, you know, if you wanted it, it, it wasn't available to you. And, and, and I say that in that, um, in that when people are, are not watching, it's easy to be, Hey, 
let, let me go here. Let me do this. Let me do X, Y, Z. And for me, um, you know, I had to watch who I was hanging out with. You know, I had to these certain guys or, you know, certain people, football related or not. I had to, you know, watch my relationship, so to speak. I even know, you know, after, um, you know, being married to my wife, we kind of had a thing and it was, you know, we joked about it in the locker room, but it was serious that, you know, if you weren't, you know, a married guy, I, I couldn't hang out with you on a social aspect. You know, we could, you know, always go to dinner as a group. Um, but if it was just one-on-one and you weren't, you know, married, well, I didn't want to put myself in that situation, Hmm. you know, in that, you know, as a single guy, you know, there's, you know, opportunities and things that you might pursue and that's fine. But for myself being married, I don't want to put myself in that situation. So, you know, we had, you know, kind of a thing when, you know, we would sign new guys and they would stand up in, in our defensive meeting room and they would introduce themselves and, you know, the first thing we'd ask would be like, hey, you married or you single? And if a, a guy was like, oh, you know, I, I'm single, I'd be like, oh, well, sorry, I can't hang out with you. Hmm. But, you know, but it was it was kind of, you know, it was a joke, but we were serious in that we knew that we had to guard ourselves from the temptations and, um, you know, the, 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 the accessibility that comes as an NFL player, um, but knew that, you know, to, to guard that and to protect that, uh, you know, covenant relationships with our wives, we had to make sure that we put ourselves in the right situations. But were you also aware or cognizant of the fact that you could be a, a light and influence on this younger player to oh, be that oh, influence as well, right? Oh, of course, of course. And we always, you know, not only led by example, but, you know, we talked from experience and we would say, you know, hey, you know, I remember being where you are that age where you're you're single and, you know, you know, everything's in front of you. But, you know, lo- knowing that, you know, the wrong choices can lead you to destruction. You know, the, the wrong choices can lead you to, you know, um, you know, situations that could have, you know, the pen- you know, penalties or consequences throughout the rest of your life. And, um, you know, the importance of, you know, speaking from experience and gu- guiding the younger guys, um, you know, really helped. And, you know, guys were, you know, very, you um, you know, they're, they're very receptive to it. Let's go, uh, let's take a pivot a little bit to some of the issues away from the field. I guess they're sort of on the field too with the NFL. Uh, and just what's kind of happening right now with the league and the policy that the NFL has instilled as far as the national anthem. Uh, all that came with that last year. And then even recently with, you know, our president uninviting, if you will, the Philadelphia Eagles uh, for coming to the White House to celebrate their Super Bowl championship. And, um, you know, the Eagles were actually one of those teams that um, didn't kneel. None of the players kneeled during the national anthem. In fact, they didn't even go to the locker room. They were there um, standing in unity. I just wonder, I guess, James, my question is, as a Christian NFL player and an African-American, what is the response here that that – I don't know, that players, that people should have, because we have perceptions from the outside, those of us who aren't players, even those of us like myself, I'm a, I'm a white American, you know, I don't, I'm not an African American, I don't have the same, uh, you know, uh, experiences, if you will, and, but I'm still a brother in Christ, and yet, even Christians, I think, are so divided on so many issues in, in, uh, that are out there publicly right now, and this one being one of them, so how for you, should that Christian NFL player response be to what we're seeing right now? Yeah. Well, you know, what, what I often say is, and I'll speak from, you know, just from a Christian standpoint is that whenever you see, you know, your brother or sister in Christ, um, you know, struggling, you should lend a helping hand. Um, You know, what I would love to see, you know, in the body of Christ is, Regardless if there's a situation that directly affects you or me, um, knowing that when it affects one of our brothers or sisters in Christ, that we're there to support. And Mm -hmm. I think what often happens is that people don't want to say the wrong thing. So, you know, if I say the wrong thing, you know, I might be looked at wrong or looked at or, or isolating myself. Um, so I just won't say anything at all. And that's not where dialogue can take place. 
you know, dialogue can take place in first, you know, educating oneself and then asking, you know, how can I help? You know, regardless if as a black man, the same things that, you know, affect me, um, you know, won't won't affect you, you know, Jason. But right. at the same time, we're both brothers in Christ. So we have a bond um, that's that's deeper than, you know, what's in the natural. You know, we're we have we have something that's going to be eternal, you know, and um, that should that should mean more. And, you know, one thing that, you know, that I often say and even, you know, say to my wife, my wife's white and I, you know, and I love her, love her to death. But in in the kingdom of God, there isn't a race. There isn't an ethnicity. There isn't a denomination. It's one kingdom, you know. And and us as believers are a part of that. And so for us to let things that, you know, we don't understand divide us, it isn't, it isn't, I don't think it's right. I think that we should, you know, lean or, or learn and find a way that we can lend um, a helping hand in the issue. And, you know, speaking more directly to, um, you know, the, 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 the protests of, you know, social injustice and, um, how the NFL has um, put in this new rule, um, what it, it continues to do is just create further isolation and it doesn't, it doesn't fix the issue. I often say, um, you know, what the, we look at, you know, and we talked about the NBA earlier. Mm. Um, we look at some of the things that they offer for their, their players. They have, you know, um, a fund that goes towards, you know, funding uh, different um um, you know, uh, uh, player, uh, uh, player, uh, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Programs. Different, yeah. Different programs that the players and highlights different programs, um, that the players are involved in, um, off the court and, you know, doesn't look at it as, as a negative, but look at it as, Hey, this is what, um, our players represent and adds, it brings added value to the NBA. Um, you know, in terms of the NFL aspect, it's, you know, isolating it as a distraction rather than finding a true solution. Well, if this is something where players are, you know, are are witnessing and a part of um, social injustice, um, how can we, you know, shine a light to it positively? And, you know, how can we help them, you know, bring more awareness to it, whether we highlight, you know, um, you know, players, um, you know, different initiatives prior to games on the jumbotrons and where fans can get, you know, more information about, you know, getting involved and, you know, creating different funds. That is a way to, you know, bring resolution to it rather than saying, you know, on the other end, if you choose to kneel, you know, there'll be a penalty towards your team. And then, or if you do not want to kneel, you'll have to stay in the locker room and then Essentially, you'll be coming out of the locker room by yourself after the national anthem, which creates more isolation, mm -hmm. um, you know, for, for, for players and, and, and for teams in general. So I, I don't think the, 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 the approach of the NFL is, you know, all inclusive. Um, and I think, you know, there's ways that we can, you know, learn from our counterparts in the M and NBA in terms of making it so. I had a, a pastor on recently on the podcast, Lance Crump. He also played in the NFL for a few years. And I asked him, I said, what's the biggest problem? I said, is it listening? Because I feel like a lot of us aren't listening right now uh, to whatever it is, the other side, however you want to say it, uh, those who disagree with us, those who don't see it the same way as we see it. And this is within the church. So I asked him, I said, is, is listening the one thing that we really need to, to work on? And he actually disagreed and said, that's, that's about number five on my list. He said the number one thing we need to do is become more liter biblically literate in yeah. what the Bible says and have a really good understanding on the Word of God and, and understand it, study it, and then from there, our our response would come from a place of that, of faith, of Jesus. Um, what's your reaction to that? I think um, that that's spot on. I, I couldn't agree more in terms of, you know, having that not just not just I'm a Christian, but truly knowing the word of God is going to be the cornerstone and foundation of our walk as believers. How can you know, um, you know, really what God wants you to do if you're not 
reading his word and what he says to do. Um, and I think that would shine a lot in terms of the compassion that we would have one to another and the ability to operate of, well, this is how I feel. Well, if us as believers know that the word of God is, you know, the, is, is the authority and the power of God, um, you know, through faith, well, then it doesn't matter about what I feel. It's about what the word says. And then therefore that becomes the common ground for believers to, uh, to move and communicate on. So I, I agree 100%. You talked about programs and getting involved. One of the biggest things that you're involved with is Hope Africa, uh, a foundation that you helped run and founded with your family. Tell us about Hope Africa and what that's all about. Yeah, well, Hope Africa is an acronym for uh, helping our people excel. And, you know, it's really um, comes from, you know, as I discussed, you know, we, we discussed earlier was, you know, my parents' Uh, you know, story and testimony coming from, you know, Nigeria uh, to the United States and how there's so many other, um, you know, Nigerians that are in the same uh, situation and Africans in general that, you know, have the work ethic and the mindset um, to excel, um, you know, through academics, but just do not have the the financial, um, you know, support to do so. We started Hope Africa um, to give students of African descent, um, you know, that are here in the United States, whether you're, you know, um, born in the United States first generation or you come over on, you know, a school visa, uh, the ability to, you know, pursue your academics through um, the last dollar in scholarship where, you know, there's kind of a void between where your financial aid and, um, you know, just, you know, books and everything comes into play. And that's usually around, you know, five to ten thousand dollars you know, a semester and we, you know, bridge that gap for our students so they can truly focus on their academics and, you know, not have to, you know, work and study at the same time and let their, you know, studies fall. Um, so it really gives them that, that ability to, uh, you know, to pursue their education with everything that they have. Where can people go to find out more about Hope Africa? Um, we have our, our website. It's um, hopeafricausa.org. Um, and, you know, you can please read the, the testimonials of, you know, the number of students that we have um, all the way from, you know, Boston University to Ohio State, um, you know, to, to um, uh, Amherst College, um, Yale. We have a lot of, um, you know, uh, top level to high level, if you'd say, um, you know, scholars uh, in, in our program and, you know, just ways that you can donate and, and, and be a part of. HopeAfricaUSA.org is the website. This has been great talking to you, James. This is our final question here. We ask it to many of our guests on the podcast, and it's, it's sometimes it's an easy question, but not an easy answer. You're 34, just recently retired, March 2018. Two kids, a third on the way, married, lots going on with you, new, new phase of life. So what, is, what has the Lord been teaching you right now in this season where you are and uh, where, where you're at in life? What have you been learning from the Lord? Um, you know, the Lord has truly been, you know, teaching me about, you know, his kingdom, you know, and, and what does that, that really mean? You know, Jesus, you know, um, has shown me and, uh, through, you know, just this time that it's not about, you know, I, I didn't die on the cross for you to live, um, you know, just any life that you wanted, you know, or just continuing to live that you life that you wanted, but rather that, you know, Jesus died on the cross that we would live the life that he lived, that he was our example. And just truly what that means to be in the kingdom and that, you know, God wants to to dominate my life, so to speak, that he's not just savior, but he's Lord. And, you know, the first part of, you know, him truly being, you know, the front of my life is seeing him as a Lord and not just savior, seeing him as the one that rules um, and reigns in my life, in my situation, you know, on my behalf um, and submitting myself, you know, to him and to, and to, and to his word. So that's really been, you know, the part of, you know, where I am in my faith now is trying to take that next step to, you know, everything that, you know, trying to take that next step to everything that God has for me and just, and wanting that for my life and for my children. He is James Ahedebo, 10 years as an NFL defensive back, 
Super Bowl winning defensive back with the Ravens, played in two Super Bowls. It's been a lot of fun talking to you, man. I'm glad we got into some of the deeper conversations as well and just wish you nothing but the best in retirement and we'll hopefully catch up very soon. Oh, thanks so much, Jace, for having me. Um, you know, God bless you and uh, really thank God that you're able to do uh, Sports Spectrum and, and have me on the show. And we do thank James Yehedebo for joining us here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Really like talking to him. You can tell his heart is centered around who Jesus Christ is, first and foremost. And I love his response to so many of the questions that we talked about and, and topics that we talked about, especially with regards to spiritual battles and temptations. I love that he, you know, basically instilled a rule in place to not hang out one-on-one outside with single men, single players on his team. Uh, It didn't mean that he couldn't be a mentor or pour into them, but he just knew that the mindset of a single man versus the mindset of a married man was different. And so he put up boundaries and, and, and protected himself from falling into temptations that come with being an NFL player. So I just appreciated James's heart and, and thankful and grateful to him for coming on and thankful and grateful for you listening to this podcast. And we're thankful as well to Compassion International. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. Check it out. I, I promise you, you'll see these children. You can pick uh, which child that you feel led to sponsor. $38 a month gives them education and medical care, food, training, all of that for 38 bucks a month. And I'm telling you, it's the best amount of money you will spend each and every month. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. Release a child from poverty and sponsor a child today. Thank you so much for joining us here on the podcast. You can always reach us on Twitter at sports underscore spectrum. Of course, Facebook and Instagram as well. You can email us here at the show directly to myself, Jason at sportspectrum.com. And email us any guest ideas that you have or any athletes. Maybe you came across somebody and you were like, you know what? That person would make a great guest on the Sports Spectrum podcast or that person, that story would be a great story to be featured on Sports Spectrum. Maybe we'll write an article on that person instead of doing a long-form podcast. But we rely on people like you to obviously uh, pray for us, to um, donate to us, but also to provide us with any ideas, any topics that you think is worth covering. So send us over your ideas, jason at sportspectrum.com, or of course you can tweet at us. And we just thank you so much for joining us here on the podcast. We really appreciate you. We hope you have a blessed day, and we'll talk to you next time right here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast.